Hey church, me again. Just thought I'd jump back in here and let you all know that there's been some very real complications around us showing Murray's message today. So in the interest of keeping people safe and not wanting to do anything that would retard the advancement of the gospel, we've decided to show that next Sunday. Instead today, we're going to enjoy a message from Andrew Gardner, and this will really wrap up the gospel clarity series that we've been in really well. So I invite you to sit back, relax, enjoy, and prepare for God to speak to you through his word. Thanks for being understanding, and bless your heaps. Well, hey everyone, uh, I'm Andrew Gardner, one of the pastors here at the Vine Church in Hong Kong. Um, before I get into it, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, I've got one of those kind of strange accents that if I don't explain to you uh, where I'm from, you might spend the first 20 minutes trying to work that out and not listen to a word of what I say. Uh, so I, I was originally born in the UK uh, and uh, lived in the UK for about seven years. At the age of seven, moved to the US with my family, uh, lived all over the US for about four years. And then as a family, we came to Hong Kong when I was 11. And I've pretty much lived in Hong Kong ever since. Uh, this is my home. Uh, and I've had a couple of stints outside of the city for education. But otherwise, uh, for the rest of my life, I've been here in Hong Kong. So I have, uh, I guess, what I call a, a Hong Kong international accent. It's like a melting pot of a lot of different experiences and cultures and backgrounds. Um, I actually have a, a strong and deep connection to New Zealand. Uh, my wife is a Kiwi. Uh, she's from Hamilton. Um, don't hold that against her. She's a wonderful person. Um, but uh, she's from Hamilton. Uh, and actually, I spent four years uh, doing my theology study in New Zealand at Laidlaw College in Auckland. Uh, and so if there's something that you disagree with in what I say <laughs> for the next 45 minutes, uh, you can blame Laidlaw. That's how it works. So first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about my context here in Hong Kong. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do as a church, just so that you understand some of that context. And then secondly, I want to actually map out what I would call a, a biblical theology uh, of justice, how we understand biblical justice, and in particular, what we call the whole gospel. How do we understand the gospel sitting around uh, the idea that justice sits at the very center of God's heart and therefore sits within the center of our gospel narrative? And then thirdly, at the end, I want to then apply what we've looked at through Scripture uh, to one particular episode in the life of Jesus. I want to go to that moment uh, towards the end of Jesus' life where he sees Jerusalem, stands on that hill in the triumphal entry, uh, and he actually embraces and then engages with his city, uh, which is Jerusalem. We're going to have a look at kind of uh, some of the things that take place in Jesus' life in that moment and kind of bring this all together. So that's what I hope to achieve in our time. Uh, let me start telling you a little bit about the vine in this community of faith. Uh, the Vine started back in 1996. Uh, we were actually a church plant out of a Baptist church at the time, a very international expatriate Baptist church. Uh, and we launched really with a team of 40 people. And I was blessed to be a part of that team of 40. Um, I was actually 21 at the time. Uh, and uh, we, we really launched the church with a passion and a heart uh, to really experience and express more of a charismatic uh, background to faith than what perhaps the Baptist church that we had been a part of uh, was going through. And, and really for the first sort of 10 years of our life, uh, that was really our focus. We were a volunteer-led uh, church body. Um, I was very involved in the leadership and the preaching and teaching in the early days. And then as a church, we really were, I guess, what you'd call a traditional, um, somewhat large, uh, charismatic church, uh, where worship was real uh, center, you know, the teaching and preaching was kind of designed to be inspirational. Uh, we had a bunch of different ministries that kind of flowed out of that. But a real focus around, I guess, our Sunday gatherings, what we do for 90 minutes on a Sunday, uh, and really that being the, the totality and the centrality of everything we did as a church. But all of that changed in 2012. And it changed by receiving a letter. Back in those days, uh, you still got letters in the post. Uh, and we got this uh, beautiful letter from a, a couple that we didn't know, a Sri Lankan couple, who were actually in a detention center in the heart of Hong Kong. And they reached out to us and they said, hey, we, we would love some pastors from your church to come in and to read and teach the Bible to us. Uh, and we were like, oh, I don't know if I do that. You know, we had to pray about that for a while and decided that was something we wanted to do. Uh, well, of course, that was exactly uh, what we wanted to do and we were passionate about it. And so, sure, we said, yeah, we'll send in some of our pastors. So two of our pastors went into the detention center, met with this Sri Lankan couple and quickly discovered that they were asylum seekers in the city. They had come into Hong Kong and the reason why they were in detention is that they had claimed asylum at the border and they were given a certain amount of time that they were allowed to stay in the city 
But after they stayed uh, from that amount of time, they were then, quote unquote, arrested, put in the detention center, whilst they lodged their application with the UN Human uh, Rights Organizations. And so that was what they were presently doing. And they wanted to learn from the scriptures. They weren't from a Christian background, uh, but they were interested in discovering what the Christian God would have to say to their particular context. And so we began to meet with them regularly. And after about a month or so, there were 15 asylum seekers that we would meet gathered in a room in the detention center once a week, uh, opening the scriptures together, talking about what God's heart is for their situation and, and for life and what the gospel really is. Um, well, a few months later, this couple uh, were released from detention and literally they showed up at our church doorstep. They knocked on our door and they said, we're out of detention um, and we have nothing. Uh, we, we need your help. Uh, we have nowhere to go. We're homeless. Uh, we have no food. We have no money. Um, we have no education for our children. Literally, they had all these felt needs that they needed to be met. Uh, and they said, you're the only people in the city that we really know. Can you help us? Well, well, of course, we responded and we helped them. And what started with one couple all those years ago has now grown to a, a ministry to asylum seekers and refugees in our city. Uh, and on a weekly basis right now, we're meeting with and helping connecting with, uh, helping with resources with around about 600 refugees on a weekly basis, of which about half actually come to our church fellowship on Sunday. So about 300 or so uh, regularly attend our services on a Sunday. Now, you could imagine that's radically changed our church. Uh, these refugees and asylum seekers are from a whole bunch of different cultures and backgrounds. They're from a whole different bunch of places. And so it's really changed and transformed the multicultural focus of our church over these years. In fact, we did a, a survey just a few years ago and we asked the church, what's your native language? And we had over 55 different responses. Imagine that, 55 different native languages within the church body, within our community of faith. Uh, that, that certainly makes uh, discipleship challenging uh, when you're trying to reach and meet uh, with so many different cultures and backgrounds, but also really brings, I think, church alive. And we, we love that flavor and culture that that community brings to us. And what's really interesting is when you're, when you're beginning to work with people who are in desperate need like they are, you begin to kind of learn and understand some of the other justice issues that come around them. Uh, and quickly we began to understand that many of these asylum seekers and refugees had fled persecution in their home cities, had come from Africa or the Middle East, Sri Lanka, Nepal, these sort of places, had come to Hong Kong fleeing that persecution and they were carrying post-traumatic stress with them, they were carrying all these issues that they needed to deal with, uh, at the same time as trying to navigate a very complex system uh, in our city on how they can get asylum, hoping to become refugees and then be relocated to a new country. And as we began to understand their stories better, we also began to understand uh, that there were other justice issues that were coming alongside. Uh, and we were really opened up to the issue of human trafficking. This was something that actually came uh, very closely to us uh, in the early part of working with this community. And looking at the issue of forced migration, a number of these asylum seekers were claiming asylum, uh, were claiming torture, uh, or were torture claimants in our city uh, because they had been uh, trafficked into the city, forced labor migration, uh, and that was a major issue. One that we knew was happening on our store step that we didn't even understand. And out of that came our realization that there was a bunch of these people that were caught up in the sex work or the sex trade in Hong Kong, many of them forced into that trade against their own will. Um, and this day, to this day, we have a ministry right now. It's a, a bit of an undercover ministry for us, uh, but one where we send teams regularly into the red light district, which is literally just a few blocks away from where I'm standing right now, uh, to go and minister to the men and women that are caught up in that industry. So asylum seekers, refugees, and those caught up in human trafficking have become central justice focuses and ministries for us. And something really happened after about five years of walking with this community, which I, I think is kind of fascinating. After about five years of meeting their felt needs, there was a shift that took place. And the refugees and asylum seekers began to say to us, look, um, you know, thank you. You've taken care of our, our needs. We have homes now. We can get education for our kids. We've got enough money now uh, to feed ourselves. The problem we have now is that we want you to stand with us as a voice against the system that we're now stuck in. Uh, we want you to advocate on our behalf to those around us. In other words, we don't want you just to meet our felt needs, but we want you to go a step further. And I think this is actually a really important thing that we all have to grapple with as pastors, as churches, when we're helping people in our vulnerable communities with their needs. At some point, you get to the point where the felt needs are dealt with or, or being cared for, and you're at a crossroads. And you have to ask yourself, are you actually going to go beyond that and ask the question, why are these people in the place that they're in in the first place? 
Like, what has happened that's brought them into that context? And that becomes then a critical question. And see, we understood as a church, our gospel helped us to understand that, that we knew we were supposed to meet these felt needs. We knew what it says about the Bible. We knew what it says about, about feeding widows and orphans and looking after those who need to be cared for. We understood all of those things about, about reaching out to those vulnerable communities from the scriptures. But what we began to ask was a question like this. What is God's heart behind the broader and bigger injustice story of our world? In other words, what does the scriptures say that goes beyond just meeting felt need and actually begins to address some of the broader systemic issues that we were facing? That was the question that our refugee community was asking of us. And I want to say we probably didn't have a broad enough gospel to help us to truly understand and respond to that question. And so that led us into a, a season of prayer of studying scripture, a season of really beginning to understand what is this bigger narrative and can our gospel answer that larger question of how God has a heart beyond not just meeting those felt needs, but also perhaps driving a spoke in the wheels of injustice themselves. And that really leads me into the second part of what I want to be talking about with us today. Uh, and that is to, to give you a sense of where we came out with in terms of this broader gospel. How we begin to see what we call the whole gospel. How social justice and God's heart for justice and his heart for, heart for restoration of all things actually sits right in the middle of this good news that we have for the world. And, and to do that, I, I want to actually map that out here on, on this little chart. And I, I want to kind of just go uh, for a few minutes here. Uh, and really, I, I'm going to have to be pretty high level with some of this because I totally understand that we're, we're under a bit of a time crunch right now. Um, so I'm going to go quite quickly through a biblical overview from Genesis through to Christ uh, to give us a sense of how I think justice sits uh, within the broader narrative of our scriptures. And really, the, the starting point of all of this is to understand that at the beginning of scripture, we have these two very critical moments. We have the garden uh, in Genesis. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, I just want to say this. Uh, I write in tongues. You may need to pray for an interpretation. Okay, my, my writing is pretty terrible, uh, but hopefully you'll, 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 you'll see this and, and keep up with me as I go. But in Genesis 1 and 2, we see this beautiful picture, don't we, of God as creator. And he comes in, he creates the pinnacle, and we'll skip through the, uh, the six days pretty quick. But at the pinnacle of his creation is this thing called humanity. You and I, male and female, made in the image of God. And this Imago Day really sits over the idea of what it was for us to be made and created by God. We are this beautiful image of of God. Now, of course, Scripture has a lot to say to us about what that image of God is all about. And, and it can cover a whole bunch of different things. But right central to it is the idea of relationship. The idea that in the Trinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we see this beautiful, eternal, inherent community amongst them. So as we are made in this image of God, we're made in relational community with God. And, and, and actually what you get to see in Genesis 1 and 2 is God creating humanity and placing within it the boundaries of a number of critical relationships. And these relationships are set up in Genesis 1 and 2, and God declares these relationships as good. So there, there are things like, um, there's actually four of them. We see us and God. We see us and ourselves. We see us and others, those that are around us. And finally, the uh, final relationship is us and creation. And these are the four critical relationships that are established right there at the beginning of Genesis 1 and 2. And God says, look, through this, as you, as you partner with me in the stewardship of creation, as you work together, male, female, in that stewardship process, um, you can bring all of my creation into what we see at the end of Genesis 1 and 2 as this beautiful picture of Shalom. The way things ought to be, the way things got to design them to be, and these relationships in what Adam and Eve describe as they were naked and unashamed. This, uh, the, the Hebrew there for naked is aramin. It means to be transparent, laid bare, nothing to hide, no shame. The end of our picture of creation is that in these four relationships of us with God, us with ourselves, us with one another, us with creation, we can work together in stewardship to create an environment in the world which God says is rest, is peace, is shalom, the way things 
ought to be. That's the beautiful picture of how things all start. Now we know what happens, of course, uh, right here in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve take on the narrative, and they're joined by a new character. Right there in the first verse of our third chapter uh, is Satan. Uh, I didn't write that right. I'm going to fix that. There you go. Is Satan. And Satan is this main character, of course, in the rest of the biblical narrative. And we see in the garden this really interesting thing. God says, look, you can eat of all the fruits, but you can't take of the fruit of this one tree. And we know it as the knowledge, and this is really important, the knowledge of good and evil. And he says to Adam and Eve, that's the one place, the one tree that you cannot mess with, the knowledge of good and evil. The idea being that if they were to take from that tree, they would be shifting from the idea of an image of God being made in this image to actually wanting to be gods themselves. And this is what you actually see Adam and Eve kind of wrestling with Satan on. It's like they desire to be gods. They want to be gods with him. They, Satan convinces them that God is not this open and vulnerable, naked and unashamed with them. That their relationships are not shalom. That God is actually holding back on them. And they begin to think, okay, uh, we actually don't want to just be the image of God. We want to actually be gods. And there's an incredible sense of injustice in the thinking here. Because they begin to think, we want to take from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we want to actually begin to redefine for ourselves what right and wrong is. We want to be in the position where we get to be the ones that declare and determine what right and wrong is all about. And what you see happen right at the beginning of our biblical story is one of the things that I think is... um, essential to the whole idea of injustice and that is the concept of self-preservation adam and eve decide to take from that fruit tempted as they are by satan because they want to redefine right and wrong in their own eyes they want to preserve themselves at the expense of the other And, and we see this happen straight away because when that sin takes place god shows up in the garden doesn't he and he cries out where are you and they've immediately hidden from god And when God draws them out, he says to Adam, like, did you just take of that fruit from that tree that I said you shouldn't take? And what does Adam do? The very first thing Adam does is he says, it it wasn't me. It was the, the one that you put in this garden with me. That woman, she was the one who caused me to do this. I think it's really interesting that the first act of injustice in the scriptures is a man self preserving himself at the expense of a woman. I think that's something that we see continuing, not just in the body of Christ, Uh, but around the world, even to this day. And there's Adam trying to self-preserve himself at the expense of another. And if you want to understand what sits at the heart of all injustice, it's that reality. And in this self-preservation, of course, it creates for us this idea of sin. And what sin does, and this is really important, is it immediately ruptures and breaks all four of those relational connections that God had set up in Genesis 1 and 2. Immediately, and we don't have time to go into this in detail, but you can look at it yourself in Genesis 3 later. But immediately their relationship with God is broken. They hide from God because they're ashamed. No longer wanting to draw close to God, they're now separated from Him. They begin to also feel bad about themselves. They realize that they have done wrong. They are ashamed about their physicality, where they were naked before and unashamed. Now they feel ashamed about their identity and who they are. So immediately that relationship with themselves is broken. They immediately break their relationship with one another. There's Adam throwing his wife under the bus. There's there's Eve trying to blame something else as well. And there's this enmity immediately between humanity itself. And then finally, with humanity and creation. You see in Genesis 3 that when God brings those judgments to Adam and Eve, he says to Adam, from now on, creation is not only going to be this place of flourishing for you, but there's going to be sweat and tear and pain for you as you begin to work with creation and work the land, the place that I've given you to steward. It was supposed to be a place of shalom for you. It's now going to be a place of toil and difficulty. And those things begin to play. So all four of those relationships very importantly, are ruptured and marred right there in Genesis 3. I hope you're tracking with this and still making sense. Now, um, because of time, I don't have time to go into this in a lot of detail, but the rest of the Old Testament narrative is really the question that humanity is asking. Can we ever know that experience of Genesis 1 and 2 again? Can we ever be reconciled with God again? Can we ever be in that place of shalom again? 
And throughout the Old Testament narrative, you see a, a picture of a God who's pursuing humanity. And so you have the call uh, of Abraham. And that call happens uh, right there in Genesis 12. And God comes and takes uh, Abraham from his community, brings him out of that community and says, with you, I'm going to start a new community, a new nation uh, where you're not even going to be able to count their numbers in the sky. And he gives him that, that prophetic kind of abundant promise, that covenant with Abraham, um, that he was going to be a blessing to all nations. Notice this, from a place of rupturing and injustice, the desire for self-preservation, God comes and calls Abraham and says, we're going to bring this all back together. I'm going to create a new nation and you guys are going to represent my heart for the world. And there, you're going to be a blessing to all nations. There's going to be restoration and shalom through all that you do. And so out of the call of Abraham, we get the next great picture. And that's the picture of the Exodus. And the Exodus narrative is so central to our understanding of justice. Because in the Exodus narrative, we see actually the heart, the manifest heart for God for justice. God sees that his people, the Israelites, are enslaved in Egypt. And actually it says in Exodus 2 that his heart is rendered for that. He has such compassion for that. And he wants to come down and do something about it. So immediately you are introduced in the Exodus narrative to a God where compassion sits at the center of who he is. Not only that compassion... But then you see this God bring advocacy against those that were bringing injustice to his people. He raises up, of course, Moses and Aaron. They go to Pharaoh and he says, I want you, Pharaoh, to, to let my people go. And Moses and Aaron become advocates through the voice and the word of God to those that were in power, speaking truth to power in order to release the slavery and release the injustice on a people. So immediately you see compassion and advocacy right at work in the center of the biblical story. And out of that advocacy then, of course, comes action. What God does next is he actually begins to move by the power through the plagues and then through the miracles of the journey in the wilderness. God releases his enslaved people and he brings them to a promised land. To a place that he says is a place abundant with milk and honey, somewhere where they could find rest for themselves, where maybe they could begin to create that shalom and live in that shalom that they've been called to do. It's a gift to them. He's liberated them out of their unjust slavery, and he's brought them out of that compassion, advocacy, and action into a new land, a new place, where they should be now able to flourish again in shalom. But we know the story, don't we? We know that Israel struggles in the promised land. We know that sin still is in their hearts and still at work around them. We know that their relationships with one another and with other nations is ruptured. And this leads them into a place where God begins to work through a new vehicle. And he begins to raise up the prophets. And the prophets are one called by God to bring his word of both grace and judgment to the people. And I think it's so easy for us to think of the prophets like these, these judges who just come and bring doom and gloom onto Israel. But actually, every prophet was a position and a perspective of grace. They, they were saying to Israel, look, something's going to happen to you unless you change your ways. Look at the injustice in you. Look at the things that you're not doing right. You know through the commandment of the law given on Mount Sinai that God is here for you. You know that this is all at work, but that's not happening anymore. And in fact, there's really three things that the prophets primarily speak about. And they speak about the idea of righteousness or the righteous. They speak about the idea of justice and they speak about the idea of the wicked. And these three things, the righteous, justice and the wicked are pulled throughout the whole of the Old Testament narrative. And really what the prophets help us to understand is how God begins to see the work of those who are righteous and those who are wicked, and how those things are opposed to one another. And justice is the thing that actually can reconcile towards the righteous. I think, I think a way of thinking about it is actually like this. Um, I think the Old Testament narrative would teach us that the wicked are those who are willing to disadvantage the community for the advantage of themselves. Very similar to how Adam treats Eve right there in Genesis 3. Let me say that again. The wicked are willing to disadvantage the community for the advantage of themselves. The righteous are spoken about in the Old Testament as those who are willing to disadvantage themselves for the advantage of the community. 
This is the, the beautiful imitation of what it is to be righteous. This is how the righteous and the justice work together. The righteous live out the heart of God through the law of God in order to bring that reconciliation between man and one another. And so they say, look, I'm willing to disadvantage myself if it means that we as a community can be in this place of shalom, that place that we've always been called to be. And so the prophets bring the hope of righteousness and justice, but only if they turn from their chosen sin, from that brokenness that is amongst them. And what happens is that begins to spiral towards the end of the New Testament uh, narrative. That spirals to this idea um, that, that actually they can't do it themselves. And by the time you get to the end of the Old Testament narrative, despite all that God has done, they're beginning to cry out to themselves and say, we can't do this. We can't change this. God's going to have to come and act again. That's the critical thing. God's going to have to come and act again in his power to change this. And by the time you get to the Old Testament, that's the cry of Israel. They've gone through the exile. They come out of exile. They've realized where they've sinned, but they also realize that they cannot fix it. And it's almost like the Old Testament finishes on its tiptoes, leaning forward, saying God's going to have to bring one who's going to be able to make this all right. And of course, that then leads us to Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And right there, central to the story of Jesus is, of course, the story of the incarnation. Jesus is fully God and fully human. He is one who, who is naturally and importantly both of those things. He needs to be fully God because it's only God that can deal with the sin issue um, that they're all focusing with. But he has to be fully human because ultimately the sin issue came in through the pathway of our humanity. And so in the incarnation, God is the one who can finally do what the prophets were long speaking about. And what you see in the ministry of Jesus is this idea of compassion so often what he did in his miracles and his healings is in compassion. You see the advocacy, him speaking up on behalf of the vulnerable and the oppressed all the time. You see his action in his teachings and his words and in his miracles. And all of that leads, of course, to the cross. To the place where we begin to really truly understand the good news of the gospel. Now, here's where we have to pause. Because here is actually where we can challenge ourselves and begin to think about how we come to understand the gospel. Think about it this way. When I was to say to you, could you tell me the gospel? I would say most of us would describe the gospel as the idea that because of our sin and our brokenness as humanity, God sends his only son because he so loves the world, and that his son pays the price for our sin, goes to the cross, uh, takes on all of that punishment that should have come on, on us, and then dies and rises again so that we can be reconciled back in our relationship with God. I always say predominantly most of the people sitting in our churches, mine included, they think of the gospel in that way. But I want to show you something really powerful. If that truly is the whole gospel, here's, I think, the issue that we have. That's a gospel that only actually redeems one of our broken relational contexts. If the gospel is all about my relationship with God, and about how God goes to the cross to restore that relationship, all it ever does is to restore just that one thing. If you, if you will, it's one quarter of what we need in order to restore shalom. And so if our gospel is just that, then I put it to us that our gospel is not broad enough to actually bring the shalom that God truly looks for in the world. 2 Corinthians, of course. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 speaks of that beautiful reconciliation with God. But I don't know about you, but I want a gospel that is able to reconcile all of the broken relational context that we find ourselves in. And that, that is actually the gospel that the New Testament teaches and preaches to us. Because not only do we have 2 Corinthians 5, 18 about the ministry of reconciliation and how because of Jesus we're reconciled to God, we also have uh, somewhere like Galatians uh, 4, verse 7 which says that because we are in relationship with God, we're no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters of God. And if we're sons and daughters of God, look at this, we then are able to see the restoration of that broken relationship with ourselves. So from slaves to sons and daughters. So, so the gospel already, it's helped us with that reconciliation of us and God. It's helped us in our reconciliation with us and ourselves. But the gospel doesn't stop there. I mean, uh, take, for example, uh, somewhere like uh, Colossians 3.15. 
Colossians 3.15 speaks of this idea that because we are now in Christ Jesus, we are now all members of one body. We are united together as one body through Christ. So again, the restoration of that broken relationships that we have with one another. We can go from that place of division and self-preservation and enmity towards one another to being part of now one body. And then finally, of course, we got that famous passage in, in Romans 8, I think it's 19 to 22, where, where Paul comes and he says, all of creation is groaning. It's longing for its redemption. And Christ does that redemption through his death and resurrection. Now, in all that Christ is going to do in his return to, as Re- Revelation says, not to make all new things, but to make all things new. To, to restore and redeem all of creation, thereby fixing that broken ship, uh, relationship that we have with us and creation. Our gospel, if it's truly a gospel that's going to bring shalom, has to be a gospel that enables us to understand how we restore not just our broken relationship with Jesus on an individual personal level, but our broken relationships in all areas that brings this holistic idea of what justice is all about. So does social justice sit at the heart of the gospel? Absolutely. Because because without the idea of the restoration of all things, we're not ever going to be creating and bringing our world with partnership with God in that place of shalom. I love the way that N.T. Wright puts this, and I want to read a quote actually from N.T. Wright. Let, Let me read this to you. But the whole point of the gospels is that the coming of God's kingdom of earth, as in heaven, is precisely not the imposition of an alien or dehumanizing tyranny, but rather the confrontation of alien and dehumanizing tyrannies within the news of a God, the God recognized in Jesus, who is radically different from all of them, and who's in breaking justice aims at rescuing and restoring genuine humanness. Yes, Jesus did, as Paul says, die for our sins. But his whole agenda of dealing with sin and all its effects and consequences was never about rescuing individual souls from the world, but about saving humans so that they could become part of his project of saving the world. Think about that for a second. Part of his project of saving, restoring, renewing the world, joining the heart of God's for justice with our local communities of faith to see justice and shalom restored around us. That's the gospel. That's what we live, eat, drink, breathe. That's what should drive everything we do as a church community. And out of that, I want to really lead us to kind of take a look at this idea of that kind of gospel right into the heart and the life of Jesus. And so in this third and final part with us, uh, I want to read a passage actually uh, from the gospel of Luke. It's a famous passage to us of where Jesus comes and he brings that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. During his ministry, he's stayed intentionally away from Jerusalem, the city that he loves And here is the moment where Jesus crests up that hill from the Mount of Olives and gazes upon Jerusalem for the first time in what has been a number of years. And I want to pick up the story from just that point. This is Luke 19. We're going to read from verse 37. It says, When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And then he said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This uh, moment in Jesus' ministry as he enters in to engage that community engagement with his city, Jerusalem, is actually a real critical one in our understanding of what it is to live with a social justice-focused gospel. 
What Jesus does is he's standing there on that crest of the hill and what lays before him would have been a beautiful sight. I mean, the temple would have been just there on his left hand side. He would have seen the beauty of the city. And in that moment, there's this incredible worship that's happening all around him. You've got all of the disciples and the crowds cheering him, singing Psalm 118, saying, hey, blessed is the one who's arriving. These are songs that were reserved to be sung for a a conquering king returning to his city. And they choose those psalms to speak of this messianic idea that Jesus is coming to be the Messiah and to change everything in Jerusalem. And they're praising and they're cheering him on. And then Luke gives us this other perspective. In the midst of all of that worship and praising, he gives us a picture of what Jesus does. And I love this. Luke tells us that Jesus stands before the city and he weeps. I don't know if you've caught that in the text before, but he starts to weep. The the Greek word there is the word kaleo. It means not just to kind of shed a little bit of a tear. It means to wail, to sob, to kind of rend your heart. It's the kind of crying someone does when they hear the news of losing a loved one. Jesus stands in front of the city that he loves and he sees something that no one else sees. He he sees literally forward to 70 AD where Emperor Nero is going to come and and build an embankment against uh, the people and the Jewish people in Jerusalem and literally starve many of them to death. Jesus sees that prophetically, not just the physicality of Jerusalem, but the prophetic reality of what's coming to them. And his heart is broken because he realizes so many of them are not going to understand him as the true Messiah. He says, if you would only know the peace that comes to you right now, the shalom that we've been longing for arriving to you, and yet you won't see it, and this is going to happen. And it cuts him up inside, that compassion in him again. And he weeps, he wails. And Luke gives us a picture of worship and weeping side by side. I think these two things are absolutely critical when when we are to think about what a church is in its relationship to justice and to community engagement. Worship and weeping side by side. I think that's the calling on the body of Christ. And the problem is sometimes we do one of those but not the other. I think so often as the Church of Christ, we're really good at at worshiping. We're really good at gathering and praising Jesus. And, And yet that praise and that worship is not linked to that compassion for the lost or the compassion for the brokenness around us or compassion for injustice. And instead, we end only worshiping together, praising God as if everything's fine, like we're this holy huddle on a hill, completely removed from all of the stuff that's happening in our communities and the things around us. The danger if we're churches that only worship is that we get this kind of savior complex where we think that we're perfect, we're the great ones, and everybody else is doomed to destruction, and it disenfranchises us from our local communities. Jesus says, worship and weeping. Equally, if all we ever do is weep, the danger then is that we're turning into a place of bitterness, a place of angst, a place where we become these kind of social justice warriors that don't link the reality of that weeping to a saving, redeeming Christ and one that can change everything. And our weeping becomes our focus as a church community. And when that happens, we just become bitter, we become angry, and we become everything that the gospel is not speaking about. We have to bring these two things together side by side. Worship and weeping. See, when worship is connected with weeping, it keeps that praise grounded in the reality of our communities. And when weeping is connected to worship, it enables us to lament and travail, but do so in a perspective and a position of hope that comes in the person of Christ. These two things become critical for us if we want to walk out that gospel of social justice in our community. The church of Jesus Christ is always at its best when it is a community of hope wrapping its arms around a community in pain. Think about that for a sec. The church is always at its best when it's a community of hope wrapping its arms around a community in pain. And I believe that's what the gospel draws us to. I think that's the church that Jesus died for. A church that doesn't just enable a restoration of one-fourth of the gospel, our relationship with God himself. 
but a church that's dedicated to the reality of the restoration of all of our broken relational contexts and the systems that drive those contexts into more and more injustice, that we wrap our arms around that pain like Jesus did to his city in Jerusalem. And we say, this is not right. And not only is this not right, but it's not the way God had designed it to be. But there is hope. We are to be ones that can hold forth a beautiful whole gospel that brings the reality of Christ's hope to the most broken and hurting places around us. We've done this with asylum seekers and refugees and those caught in trafficking in our city. And they've told us more about the gospel than we would ever be able to tell them. There is such beauty in the reality of a God who can meet those in brokenness. And as we partner together as churches committed to meeting and engaging in our communities in ways that approach, see, weep, and then speak, I believe we'll be the church that Jesus really wants us to be. What a blessing it is that we got to hear from Murray this morning, all the way from another side of the planet. Um, and what a timely word. And we're going to continue our worship. Um, directing our thoughts we can continue to reflect on what murray has said but we can also put our attention now to what is in front of us our, the communion of the bread and the, the juice and this is a symbol of a feast right a feast that jesus inaugurated at the last supper and a feast that one day will have in its fullness when the kingdom come and in that feast, um, we're not no longer going to be going to be separated anymore. No longer going to have these lockdowns. We're all going to come together. We're all going to be unified together, and we're going to be there with our Creator, face to face to Him. What is the elements of our communion? We have bread, which is, represents Jesus' body. We have the cup, which represents Jesus' blood, which was poured out, and Jesus died so that we could have life, that we could have relationship, that we could be connected with Him. And so let us put our attention on Him this morning, redirect our focus onto Him, and the, the joy that we have, the gratitude that we have, that we get to go into the throne room of God, we get to sing His praises, we get to be in His presence. Let's lift our eyes to Him. I'm going to continue with some worship. 